Be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. Last week, Shada spoke of one teaching of the Buddha that is really central to the understanding of our lives. When he said, bhikkhus, whatever one frequently thinks about and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of the mind. So this teaching is so obvious, you know, and so far reaching. Whatever we frequently think about and ponder upon becomes the inclination of our minds. It seems so straightforward. Yet, we often forget about this in the busyness of our lives and in the seduction of our own personal stories. We forget that our minds, with everything we do and everything we think, that our minds are in the process of being trained one way or another. And it's for this reason that right thought, you know, the second step of the Eightfold Path, sometimes it's called right thought or right intention or right motivation. It's for this reason that it plays such a critical role, you know, in our unfolding spiritual journey. And the Buddha was very explicit about what constituted right thought or right motivation. He said it's those motivations of loving kindness, of renunciation, of compassion. So these are the things we want to frequently think about and ponder upon so that they do become the inclination of our minds. So tonight I'd like to speak about one particular aspect of right thought, and that is the cultivation of goodwill, the cultivation of loving kindness. The poet Rilke captured the richness and the power and the subtlety of this feeling state, mind state. He wrote that once the realization is accepted that even between the closest people, infinite distances exist. Even between the closest people, infinite distances exist. A marvelous living side by side can grow up for them if they succeed in loving the expanse between them, which gives them the possibility of always seeing each other as a whole and before an immense sky. And that image is so beautiful. A marvelous living side by side can grow up for them if they succeed in loving the expanse between them, which gives them the possibility of always seeing each other as a whole and before an immense sky. So in our lives, we sometimes meet people who can see us whole and before an immense sky, who don't judge, who don't discriminate, who seem to radiate feelings of great love and care and kindness, who can radiate these feelings towards everyone they meet. You know, and they may be well-known people that we have either met or just know about people like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know, or Mother Teresa, or Martin Luther King Jr., or Gandhi, or people who are known for this great capacity. It might be different teachers that we've had, 
you know, who also expressed this tremendous feeling of metta, of love. And it may be ordinary people in our lives who somehow have this great capacity for love. When the Dalai Lama meets you, and those of you who have had the chance to, to meet him personally will recognize this, in that moment, it feels like you are the most important person in the world because the quality of his attention on you in that moment is so complete. And he expressed his own practice of this in a very simple way. And it would be a great practice for us to undertake. <clears throat> he said, I try to meet whoever I meet as an old friend. Right? I try to meet whoever I come in contact with as an old friend. So just think back kind of in your life and you know all the different people we meet. I think we probably have a way to go in terms of greeting everybody as an old friend. But what a practice that would be, you know, and what a, what a meta-filled way of relating. Someone once described meeting Deepama, who also had this tremendous capacity for love and kindness. A teacher described being, her, being hugged by her this was in quotes, hugged so thoroughly that all my six feet fit into her great, vast, empty heart with room for the whole of creation. And that was the feeling. It was just like being embraced by the universe. With all of these people, their love is not because of who we are. You know, it's not because of our position or our wealth or our status or our intelligence. That's not the basis for their loving energy, but simply because we are fellow human beings. This is the very special quality. It's just this which is the quality of metta, of loving kindness. It's the generosity and openness of heart that simply wishes <clears throat> for all beings to be happy. It simply wishes well for all beings. So it's incredibly simple. Although we derive great benefit from metta, from this feeling and from the practice of it, <clears throat> Metta itself does not seek self-benefit. You know, in the moment of that feeling, or in the moment of that expression, that quality of the heart is not seeking anything for itself. It's not given in expectation of anything in return. And even when we direct it towards ourselves, sending metta towards ourselves, it's really just a gateway to our own open heart. There's an important consequence of this. It's precisely because there is no expectation of anything in return. Metta is not then dependent on external conditions. It's not dependent on people or beings or ourselves being a certain way. Right? If we don't expect anything in return, metta doesn't depend on anyone fulfilling our expectations because we're not expecting anything. And it's for this reason that metta Loving-kindness doesn't easily turn into ill-will, you know, or jealousy, or disappointment as feelings of love that are associated with attachment and desire so often do. You know, how, how well we know 
that in our relationships, you know, where there's a lot of desire and a lot of wanting, where there may be, there may be feelings of love, so easy for that to turn. In metta, because it's not dependent on the other person or ourselves being a certain way, it doesn't change very easily. It's very stable. What gives loving kindness its great expansive power is that in the end, when it's well developed, it doesn't make any distinction between beings. It's not a feeling that's limited to those closest to us. You know, as is the feeling of love with attachment or desire. <clears throat> now we might feel close to one person or two people or five or 10 or 20. Maybe we feel close to 50 people. But we certainly don't feel close to everybody in the world. And so love with desire, I mean, just imagine desiring every being in the world. <laughs> it would be a hell realm. <laughs> desire doesn't have that capacity. And yet it's precisely the expansive power of metta, which does have this capacity, to embrace all beings and embraces all beings with the simple wish, may you be happy. And it's for this reason, this ability to embrace all, that it's called one of the illimitables or immeasurables or one of the boundless states because it doesn't have a boundary There's a wonderful story of the Dalai Lama. This is quite a few years ago. He was at a conference at a hotel in Arizona. And they were there for a few days, and at the end of the conference, the Dalai Lama asked the management to gather all the employees of the hotel to line them up in the lobby so he could greet each one of them before he left. What an extraordinary thing to even think of. You know, before you, oh, would you please line up everybody so I can say hello? I mean, that's that quality of just all embracing metta. He wasn't making distinctions between people, between those in the conference and those not, those important, those unimportant. For him, all beings are equal. We see this possibility, we can taste this possibility, and you probably have, when in the metta practice, <clears throat> we come to the neutral person. And for myself, when I was doing this practice back in the early days in India, it was really a turning point in a certain understanding. I had been doing the metta intensively, you know, for some weeks. And we got, went through the sequence, came to the neutral person, and my teacher, Manindraji, said, well, just find a neutral person. And at first, I didn't even know what it meant. What, what's a neutral person? And then he said, well, somebody you know you don't particularly like, you don't dislike, just... So then I thought, well, there was this old gardener. I, I was staying at the Burmese Vihar, kind of uh, like a monastery in Bodh Gaya. This old gardener who I had seen every day that I was there, and I was there uh, for many, many weeks. And I realized, you know, when Munindra talked about this neutral person, here's somebody who I'd see every single day, and I had never given him a single moment's thought. He could have been a telephone pole. And that was shocking. You know, when I realized that, it was really shocking. So I took him as my neutral person. And so every day, you know, many, many hours a day, you know, may you be happy, may you be free of pain, may you be safe. It was amazing. He became my love object. You know, and after some time, every time I saw him, you know, my, just my heart lit up and I was so happy to see him. Because he didn't change and he probably didn't even know what was going on. <laughs> but what I learned from that 
which has lasted all of these years, was a tremendously important lesson. And that is the realization that how we feel about anyone is up to us. It doesn't depend on the other person. It doesn't depend on their behavior. Ultimately, how we feel about someone is up to us. So that's a tremendously empowering realization. You know, and as you work through the neutral person and maybe the difficult people, and slowly you begin to see the possibility of actually extending metta, extending loving wishes to people who you might think, oh, that's impossible, and you see it is possible, that's when we really get a sense of the power of this quality of heart and mind. It's immeasurable because it can embrace all beings. There is tremendous purity and a kind of quiet happiness in moments of genuine metta because in this feeling, there is nothing at all that is harmful. There is nothing unwholesome. So each moment of metta, where we're really connected with the generosity of that wish, you know, be happy. Each moment of metta, it's like a moment of pure gold. And we can touch that. So I'd like to read just a few lines from the Metta Sutta, which you're probably familiar with, just to hear in the Buddha's words how he described this feeling and the application of the feeling. In gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downward to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. That would be an amazing feeling to dwell in. And what is so powerful about connecting with this practice is that we see it actually can be developed. As the feelings of metta, of care, of love, of friendliness, as they grow in us and become a little more stable, it softens our minds, it softens our hearts. They become a bit smoother, not so ragged, you know, and more gentle, more pliable. And because of this softening, there's less rush to reactive judgments and comments, both about others, but also about ourselves. You know, as we dwell in the metta and things get softer, we're not so on edge reactively. We become more patient, we become more caring. You know, when there are difficulties or there's disturbances, as we're less reactive, we're also less caught up in all of our immediate likes and dislikes. So it gives more space for discerning wisdom. You know, we can see more clearly, because we're less reactive, 
what is truly skillful? What is unskillful? This greater discerning wisdom. So then we practice making wiser choices, which in turn leads to more happiness, which leads to more joy, which leads to more metta, which makes our minds and hearts softer and less reactive. So we see more clearly, more discerning wisdom, make wiser choices, we feel happy. It's just this spiral upwards. And all from this very simple practice of wishing well to beings. It's not hard. We just need to remember. As the metta grows stronger and steadier, it does become the inclination of our minds. As we think about it frequently, as we ponder it, as we practice it, this is what becomes the natural inclination of our minds. And we feel a lot more accepting and tolerant of ourselves as well as others. You know, less judgmental. And we start to live gradually in a growing field of goodwill and humor. You know, we start holding ourselves a little more lightly. This was expressed really well by the poet W.H. Auden in a line in one of his poems when he said, Trust your crook, love your crooked neighbor with all your crooked heart. <laughs> and I love that line because it's just so kind. You know, it's just the recognition that we're all in this together. We all have crooked hearts and we can love our crooked neighbor with our crooked heart. You know, and so there's just an ease and a humor and a lightness and an acceptance. Now the beauty and the power of the Buddha's teachings, as you know because you're here, is that they're not simply something to admire from a distance. There's something to actually put into practice. the Dalai Lama, if we were aware that we all contain love within us and that we could foster and develop it, we would certainly give it far more attention than we do. You know, what's so astounding about how people understand their lives, I mean, it's pretty universally understood that love is a good thing. And yet there aren't that many people who take the next step and realize, well, this is something that can be cultivated. This can be practiced. We can develop it. That's a very important realization. Although it's very easy to recognize <coughs> and va the, the value and benevolence of this feeling of metta, still as we know, there are many times in our lives when we find this quality lacking, you know, when our hearts are not open, when our hearts are not soft and pliable. So I think it's helpful to understand why. How does this happen, given the great value and benevolence of the metta feeling. There's a powerful force in the mind <clears throat> that comes masquerading as love, but which actually obstructs it and obscures it. So we want to key in to what this other force in the mind is. It is called the near enemy of metta because it looks like loving kindness we are fooled into thinking it's loving kindness, but it's not. It's quite different. And this is the mind state or the mind states of desire, of longing, of craving, of wanting. You know the old song, I think maybe it's from the 60s. I want you, I need you, I love you. As if somehow it's all the same thing. Well, they're really different things. 
The confusion of these two states, love and desire, has enormous implications for our relationships and our lives. The fact that these two states get confused. So think for a moment, just of those times, maybe it's been today or in the last few days or some other time in your life, just think back to those moments when you really felt most loving, when you really connected. Could be with a partner, could be with a child, could be with a pet. Just, and that feeling of when you're most loving. Isn't it really a great generosity of the heart in that moment? It's just the energy going out with the wish expressed in some way or other, and maybe not even verbally, just be happy. That's the wish of love. That's the gift of love. Now think of a moment when you have felt the strongest desire for someone or the strongest attachment to someone. What's that feeling life like? Very different feeling. That's a feeling of wanting rather than giving. It's a feeling of holding on to something for ourselves. You know, and when we look at our relationships, all our different relationships, in those times of desire, of wanting, it could be a wanting for pleasure. It could be a wanting fulfillment. It could be wanting acceptance. It could even be a wanting to be loved. You know, so desire or wanting can take so many different forms in our relationships with one another. <clears throat> but when we examine or look at our experience of how we feel in these two different states, we see that their energy movements are exactly opposite that the energy of loving kindness is an offering, it's a generosity. The energy movement of desire, of wanting, is this. It's a taking back, it's a holding on. So as we pay closer attention to our actual experience, you know, not taking this theoretically and not believing it just because someone is saying it. It's all an invitation really to look for ourselves in experience. The distinction between the feeling of metta and the feeling of desire or wanting, it becomes increasingly clear. We really see the difference for ourselves. What's interesting is that sometimes even in the practice of loving-kindness, these two get mixed up. And we find desire and wanting creeping into our very practice of metta. You know, as we repeat each phrase, it's a simple expression of goodwill. You know, a simple lift of, simple gift of loving attention in the moment. Is it just a simple gift, a simple offering, or are we doing it with one eye on what we're getting back from it? You know, at times in my practice, doing metta, doing metta intensively, I'd be repeating the phrases, but always kind of watching or checking Oh, am I getting more concentrated? Am I becoming more loving? <laughs> and it became more about me than the other person. I was more concerned with how I was feeling and forgetting the simplicity and the purity of the simple wish for someone's happiness. So we want to be paying attention, even as we're doing the metta practice, to see is the motivation really one of metta? Or we might be doing the metta phrases, 
but the underlying motivation might be, may you be free of all those annoying qualities that make me feel aversion. <laughs> it's not exactly metta. There are also situations in our lives when we just delude ourselves. We think it's metta, but it's not. You know, and a story I've told many times over the years, but it was such a striking example of this. Years ago, I was visiting a friend out in Western Mass, and he lived out in the country. Just a very, quite a deserted road, just a couple of houses on this long dirt road. And I was going for a walk, and in one of the houses, there was this very little yappy dog, you know, it was just barking in the yard and quite aggressively. Uh, it wasn't that big, so yeah, I wasn't really scared, <laughs> but it was clearly aggressive. So I thought, oh, I'll start doing metta. You know, oh, be happy, be happy, be peaceful. <laughs> it came over and bit me. <laughs> <laughs> and. It was sort of like the Buddha coming, because you think that's metta, it's not metta. <laughs> really, in my mind, you stay there, I'm here. It wasn't metta at all. <laughs> it's insightful and freeing when we can see clearly the difference in our experience, not theoretically, not intellectually, when we can see the difference in our actual experience between loving-kindness and desire. So that's a bit of a uh, challenge for you. Now just to be watching as you go through the day. Can you recognize those moments when the metta is really unadulterated, when there's just that wish for someone to be happy, when there's an offering and then notice those moments when there's desire in the mind, wanting in the mind. Because the more clearly we can discern the difference, the easier it is to disentangle them in our lives. We don't get so confused. And we understand more clearly for ourselves the consequences of each of those states. So, just as an example, in our close relationships, you know, in those close relationships that we have, where do fear and possessiveness and insecurity and attachment come from? Do those feelings of fear and insecurity and attachment and possessive, do they come from the feeling of metta? I don't think so. I think if we really are paying attention, we'll see those states are conditioned by desire. They're conditioned by wanting. Which of the feelings, desire or metta, bring about feelings of greater peace, greater happiness, greater contentment? As we learn to distinguish these two, metta, loving kindness, and desire or wanting, when we really see the difference, it's then possible, and see the difference in their consequences, it's then possible and we're motivated to make wiser choices. Which feeling do we cultivate? Which feeling do we let go of? what we frequently think and ponder upon will become the inclination of the mind. If we frequently think and ponder upon desire, upon wanting, that becomes the inclination. If we frequently think about loving-kindness, that becomes the inclination. It doesn't mean, though, that as soon as we utter the first metta phrase, that all of our desires and attachments fall away in that moment. But as we become more familiar 
with the unique characteristics of loving kindness. You know, as you settle in, and there, be, there may be many moments when you're doing the practice, you know, you're repeating the phrases, maybe there isn't much feeling. I'm sure you've had this experience, huh? you're doing the phrase and maybe it just feels flat. But then every once in a while, <coughs> it's as if the mind collects in the meaning of the phrase and everything settles right into the heart. And you've probably had those moments when, yes, there's a real feeling there. You know, where we're connected with that feeling. Yes, that's the feeling of metta. That's the feeling of loving kindness. When we can recognize it, you know, even for these moments, and we practice it, over time, it becomes more the way we are than what we do. Then it's not so much a practice we do, it just becomes the way we live. A couple of weeks ago, I read an article in the New Yorker magazine. It was a wonderful article about the French essayist Montaigne, who, I mean, he was really a wonderful humanist and had a great, great wisdom. And it described, Montaigne was describing a, a very deep friendship he had, a lifelong friend. And he was descri describing the quality of the relationship with this friend, you know, a very dear person to him. And I read this, and it was the most striking expression of metta. You know, so I just wanted to read just those few lines. So this is Montaigne. In a truly loving relationship, which I have experienced, and he's talking about this, this guy who was a very dear friend, Rather than drawing the one I love to me, I give myself to him. Not merely do I prefer to do him good rather than have him do good to me. I would even prefer that he do good to himself than to me. It is when he does good to himself that he does the most good to me. If his absence is either pleasant or useful to him, then it delights me far more than his presence. And that's pretty extraordinary relationship. You know, where it's all about the happiness of the other person. It was very striking to me. I was just thinking of the many relationships, both that I've been in and, you know, know of among friends, and I was just thinking, it would be pretty rare, you know, if the other person, for whatever reason, felt it more useful, you know, or pleasant to be absent, that their absence would give me more delight than their presence. Well, that's pretty striking. So in our understanding and practice of metta, I find that it's sometimes easier <clears throat> to connect with the kindness aspect than the love aspect. Because love is a very grand word. You know, it's subtle and it's complex in its meaning. And our understanding of it our understanding of love has been so conditioned by so many things. It's been conditioned by the movies. It's been conditioned by advertising. It's been conditioned by our own fantasies, you know, where we create some image of what love is. In the light of all this, <clears throat> people often feel that they are not loving enough, that somehow we don't measure up to this image or fantasy that we've created about what love is. Now, many people feel perhaps that they don't even have the capacity for love. Maybe we fantasize that it should be some great ecstatic feeling that carries us off on waves of bliss, 
you know, and then we get disappointed or discouraged when that's not the reality. So for me, kindness is a much more humble word. You know, it's much more pragmatic. It's down to earth. <clears throat> it's just a friendly and spontaneous responsiveness to the people around us. Kindness is a very basic and natural openness of heart that lets the mind in. It's not so difficult to understand what being kind means. You know, it has, it has just that ordinariness to it that makes it very accessible. It turns out that kindness is quite an innate faculty in us. So there was an experiment <coughs> done with toddlers, that is, young babies, 18 months to two years, something like that. And this was from an article in the New York Times, and Sharon Salzberg in her book, The Kindness Handbook, referenced this article. And when I read it, it just really struck me. Psychology researcher Felix Warnikin performed a series of ordinary tasks in front of toddlers, such as hanging towels with clothespins or stacking up books. Over and over, whether Warnikin dropped clothespins or knocked over his books, each of 24 toddlers, this is 18 months, you know, each of 24 toddlers offered help within seconds but only if he appeared to need it. Video shows how one baby glanced between Wannerkin's face and the dropped clothespin before quickly crawling over, grabbing the object, pushing up to his feet, and eagerly handing back the pin. <laughs> Wannerkin never asked for the help and didn't even say thank you so as not to taint the research by training youngsters to expect praise if they helped. After all, altruism means helping with no expectation of anything in return. But this is the key. The toddlers didn't bother to offer help when he deliberately pulled a book off the stack or threw a pin on the floor. And so just at this very young age, these kids were able first to discern whether he really needed the help or not. And if in that discernment, yeah, he needs help, he, you know, accidentally dropped the pin or knocked the book off, within seconds, the natural response was to come and offer it back. So the question is, how can we reconnect with this spontaneous kindness of a toddler? You know, at 18 months, we all had it. And so what happened? <laughs> How do we strengthen this aspect of metta, you know, this kindness aspect within ourselves? One of the very great Dzogchen masters of the last century, Nyosho Ken Rinpoche, he was a very extraordinary being and had this vast knowledge of the most esoteric parts of uh, Tibetan teachings. So I'd like to read one of his more esoteric messages to us. I would like to pass on one little bit of advice I give to everyone. Ready? Okay. Relax. <laughs> Just relax. Be nice to each other. As you go through life, simply be kind to people. Try to help them rather than hurt them. Try to get along with them rather than fall out with them. With that, I will leave you and with all my good wishes. The fundamentals are so simple. And all the practices we do are really about this. Relax, be nice to each other, be kind to people. 
So we need to keep this in mind. We need to remember, yeah, this can be practiced. We can remember doing this. The immediate cause for loving kindness, for these feelings to arise, it's a conditioned feeling. It arises because of certain causes. So the immediate cause for loving kindness to arise is focusing on the good qualities in people or the good qualities in ourselves. You know, we're all a package of qualities. Each one of us is the good and the desirable qualities. There are the not so skillful and the unwholesome qualities and we're all a mix. When we don't see the good in people or even the potential for good and focus instead on all those annoying, irritating qualities, it's very easy for ill will and anger and judgment to arise. It makes so much sense. You know, if we've trained our minds to always be seeking out what's wrong with people, you know, and there are unwholesome aspects, of course there's going to be judgment, of course there's going to be ill will. But if we make it a point, if we make it a practice to really seek out and see the good in each other, in each person, then the feeling of metta, of love and kindness, grows very naturally. And in this practice of seeing the good in people, it's we see it in the we see it in the context of the whole person. So we're not, it's not a question of being naive and pretending, oh, this person is all good. It's not like that. We realize we're all the package, we're all a mix. But what are we attending to? What are we focusing on? As we focus on the good qualities in people and in ourselves, we very naturally begin to respond in more generous and loving ways. You know, it's such common sense. And a great gift comes to us when we can see the good in others. I think Carol mentioned it this morning or yesterday. As we focus on the good, then the feeling of gratitude begins to arise in us. The gratitude for the good people have done for us. And the Buddha called this feeling... You know, as Carol mentioned, he called this feeling of gratitude one of the most rare and beautiful qualities in the world. Now that itself is an interesting statement. Why do you think it is that gratitude should be so rare? You know, because we often are not focusing on what's good in people or the good they have done for us. We so easily take for granted or simply forget, you know, all the ways different people have helped us. When we feel gratitude, when we can open to that feeling, whether it's to particular people or just to life itself, when there's that feeling of gratitude, metta flows completely naturally. It doesn't take any effort at all. And this happens a lot on a retreat, in the silence of a retreat. Probably, you probably have had this experience at times. We start to think of people we might not have thought of in years. And I remember being on retreat at times, people I hadn't thought of in 30 years, 40 years, all of a sudden come to mind. And because our minds are more open at that time and less defensive, less protected, as all of these people come to mind, we really begin to see metta as a basic quality of awareness. Someone once asked Deepama whether she should be practicing mindfulness or loving kindness. You know, have you gone back and forth at all? So Deepama answered, from my experience, there is no difference. For her, love and awareness were one. When you are fully loving, 
aren't you also mindful? And when you are fully mindful, is this not also the essence of love? You know, and so even though there are different practices and we can cultivate in different ways, it's really important to see that in essence, uh, there's a unity. When we're loving, aren't we also mindful at that time? And when we're really mindful, resting in awareness, have you noticed that it is a very loving space? Because it is the space of acceptance. It's the space of openness. All of this doesn't mean that we'll never get angry and never get annoyed and never get irritated. Because as we all know, these feelings come. But we can hold these feelings in a way that uh, the Dalai Lama expressed so well. He said, sometimes I do get angry, but deep in my heart I don't hold a grudge against anyone. I think that's very important. You know, moments of irritation, annoyance, even anger are going to come. But we really want to look deeply within ourselves. What's the very root motivation? And we get right down to the bottom of our attitude, our motivation about other beings. Are we holding a grudge against anyone? Or underneath all those other disturbing emotions, underneath it all, can we find that place of wishing them well? Sometimes this is a practice, you know, because there are people who have done us harm, and maybe we are holding a grudge. And so there's a whole process of forgiveness that takes place, forgiveness of ourselves, forgiveness of others. And we practice this, and you might at the beginning of each sitting, or the beginning of each day, you might practice forgiveness if you feel that, you know, there is a deeply held grudge or ill will. If I have hurt anyone or harmed anyone in my thoughts, in my words, in my actions, I ask forgiveness. And I freely forgive anyone who may have hurt or harmed or offended me. We just repeat that, you know, and re concentrate on the meaning. And as we practice that slowly, and it may, it may be quick, it may be slow, but slowly the contraction of the grudge begins to soften and we can come to that place the Dalai Lama spoke of. Sometimes we need to adjust the metaphrases. You know, because if somebody has done us a lot of harm, it might be hard to say, you know, may you be happy. Or, I wish you well. Because maybe... That's not the right words. And this came home to me very strikingly when I was teaching a course uh, after 9-11. And there were a lot of New Yorkers at that retreat. And we were doing metta and including all beings and including the enemy. But a few of these people said, there is no way that I'm able to wish these people who cause so much destruction and suffering, you know, may you be happy. It was just, that was not happening. So the immediacy of that situation really, it made me think, well, what does metta mean in that situation? You know, of such intensity, of such harm caused, of such suffering, and of course we could apply it to a thousand situations in the world. What does metta mean then? Is it really immeasurable? And as I reflected on it, I realized that even in that situation, or others like it, <coughs> can we not wish for all beings, without exception, to be free of enmity, to be free of hatred, 
Because those are the mindsets that caused all the destructive acts. Is there anybody that we would exclude from that wish? May you be free of hatred. May you be free of enmity. I don't think so. I think that we could really expand that feeling to include everyone regardless of the actions because we're wishing them to be free of the very things that cause the harmful actions. And so when we're doing metta in those kind of situations, it's not to be locked into any particular phrase or expression. We always have to find the one that's meaningful for us and that connects. Now, this willingness to train the heart, whether it's in metta or anything else, it requires great patience. It's not an immediate thing. The Buddha called patience the highest devotion. You know, and it's just, it's the foundation for every accomplishment. We just do it and we practice it and we're patient with it. And slowly the recollection of metta, the recollection of loving kindness in all aspects of our lives gradually transforms how we live. So just as a closing reminder, Thich Nhat Hanh expressed it so well. He said, happiness is available. Please help yourselves to it. And really, that's what we're doing here together. So let's sit for a few moments. May all beings everywhere be free of enmity, free of hatred and ill will. May all beings be free of danger. May all live in safety and live in peace. 